Okay, I've got 602, so uh, let's get started. So um, welcome, my name is Jim Waltman. I'm the Executive Director of the Watershed Institute. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us this evening for I'm sure will be a great presentation about uh, stream restorations. The Watershed Institute, if you're not familiar with us, um, is located in central New Jersey and our mission is to keep water clean, safe and healthy. And we do that through land conservation, environmental advocacy, uh, watershed science and education. And I work with a terrific team of scientists and advocates, educators, land stewards and other professionals. Um, tonight is the first uh, session in a new series we're launching that we're calling Watershed Wednesdays. So the third Wednesday of every month from 6 to 7, 15, PM will be um, hosting sessions like this. Um, before we get started, um, I would like to do a, an acknowledgement um, that uh, the Watershed Institute land, the lands that we're now have under our care is the traditional and ancestral territory of the Lenni Lenape. We, were, we pay respect to Lenape peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. We respect their knowledge, culture, and tradition, which have contributed to the conservation of land and water in this region. I'd add that in addition to being a water protection, water conservation organization, we're also committed to advancing goals of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in our work and in the communities within which we do that work. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us this evening. I'm excited to hear from our great uh, speakers and friends from Princeton Hydro. Um, before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to Olivia Spildoran. Um, Olivia coordinates a program at the Watershed Institute called River Friendly. She works with homeowners and schools and businesses and golf courses and pretty much anyone that's willing to work with us uh, to identify and implement land stewardship projects and improvements to how land is managed and conserved to protect water and natural resources. Olivia, take it over. And thanks again for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, so my name is Olivia and welcome to our webinar about stream bank restoration with our awesome guests from Princeton Hydro. Uh, they'll be talking to you about the connection between land and water, plus their own experiences working on restoration projects. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please put them in the Q&A box so we can bring them up after all of the presentations have been completed. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jake, Casey, and Cody. Uh, Jake, you can take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you guys for showing up up to a Wednesday evening, and, uh, and thanks, Olivia, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Jake Dittis. I'm a water resources engineer with Princeton Hydro. Um, Princeton Hydro is a small business consulting firm focused on creating resilient, sustainable, and nature-based solutions, um, specifically related to water resource engineering and natural resource management as well as a specialty in regulatory compliance. Um, and we work with nonprofits like uh, the Watershed Institute, um, public agencies, and uh, private landowners as well in the Northeast. Um, our core area is from Maryland uh, up the coast to Connecticut, where I'm at currently. Um, and specifically, I work on the river restoration team along with Casey Schrading, who you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, Corey Sparoff is also uh, going to wrap up the presentation. And I work, um, I, I, have, I have a focus on uh, stream restoration, which uh, in, including fish passage projects, the removal of dams and barriers, um, as well as, you know, stream bank restoration as well. Um, and uh, uh, also work on wetland projects and the restoration of fairling salt marshes. So a lot of restoring in uh, what I do. Um, and so I'm going to start this presentation um, with you. 
Can you guys see my slides? Yes. Um, can you see me change my slides? That's the big question. I can't see your slides, Jake. Yeah, ah, you can't see my slides. All right, that's... How about now? I see presenter view. You swap that. Then. We just ran through this, I swear, and it was working before, as it always does. How about now, can you see? All right, sorry about that. Um, so I'm gonna start off with uh, the presentation zoomed out um, a little bit, and then uh, we're gonna narrow it um, in so that you ultimately, let me make sure you can see the entire, <laughs> the entire slide, sorry. I swear we went through this, Olivia can vouch for that. Um, so we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna start off a little bit zoomed out and ultimately um, talk about some acute issues that might be at your at the stream that runs through your backyard or uh, that where you walk your dog or the, or your fishing hole, favorite fishing hole. Um, starting off with a couple uh, large scale issues, one being climate change, uh, not a surprise here. Um, how climate change is, is manifesting itself in the Northeast is uh, in one way is with increased precipitation. We can think back to the summer uh, with tropical storms Henri and Ida. And despite them uh, statistically supposed to show up storms of this, uh, of this intensity showing up, they're supposed to show up once every hundred years. Um, they showed up within a couple weeks of each other, unfortunately. And so this is an example of the increase of the short duration and high intensity rain events that we are seeing across the Northeast. There's a lot of data behind this, including uh, the this New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection study that shows that, um, or that estimates by the end of, the, of this century, um, we will see an increase between 25 and 50% of the amount of rain uh, in these short duration, high intensity storms. Um, so there's gonna be 25 to 50% more rain falling within the same time period, which sets us up uh, for a lot of rain coming from the sky. And then once it reaches the ground, um, where does it go? A lot of it is dictated by the amount of development in the watershed. Um, in a natural ground cover, a watershed that has a lot of natural ground cover, a lot of that water infiltrates into the ground and then, um, or is evaporated into the air, uh, back into the air um, from the vegetation with very little running off uh, directly into streams. However, in, think of an urbanized watershed, um, like where I'm living in Brooklyn, for example, there's a lot of concrete, a lot of buildings. Um, and what this means is that there isn't that opportunity for water and rain to infiltrate into the ground or evaporate into the air. A lot of it runs off. Think, uh, you know, a wet parking lot. You, we've all seen this. And so I'm gonna do, um, a uh, just go through a quick exercise to show how both climate change and ur urbanization then impact streams, how, um, how this is showing up in, in local streams. Um, so here's a watershed in the left. Uh, remember the, the you know, this, this watershed is, 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 is obviously a cartoon, uh, but think of it as any part, any, any rain that falls within this green ultimately drains in this, uh, this river that's shown up as in, in black. Um, and and it, it, any runoff from this watershed will eventually find its way into this river. So on the right, we see a hydrograph, what we call a hydrograph. Um, these blue bars are denoting this rainfall intensity, um, showing you know a, a three hour storm. And then this dotted line is, is showing the res river response. So a, a little bit, you can, you can it, makes, it makes sense if I explain it to you. Um, the, a little bit after the, the rainfall, we see the amount of flow or the stream discharge increasing in the storm as, as more water finds its way into the stream. And then with a ultimately peaks at a highest flow, and then uh, recedes after the storm. Um, but what happens when 
you know, we talked about climate change as these streams become, these rainstorms become more intense, the peak discharge um, in the stream, this, this, this peak here uh, becomes higher. And so there's more water finding its way into the stream. And then we take urbanization. We, uh, we need offices and homes and, and shopping malls. Um, all these are uh, much, are the, all these increase the impervious cover with concrete and buildings. Um, and what, and that means that even that the more water is more quickly running off the watershed. And so what we see is an even higher peak in, in the amount of water that's running through the stream. Um, and so as you know, it is intuitive with more uh, water in the stream comes becomes more flooding um, and more and also importantly, more stream power. So there's climate change uh, that's getting more water to the ground, uh, development that's uh, bringing that water into the stream more quickly. And so we are having higher stream uh, discharges than ever before. And it's also, I wanna note that as water uh, flows over the ground, it picks up um, you know, some things that it <laughs> harms the quality of that water. It's no longer pure rainwater. Uh, the fertilizer you put on the ground and the fertilizer your dog puts on the ground, um, as well as some more harmful chemicals um, you know, where this, the stream, the, the, more, uh, the, the more intense runoff is picking up more uh, chemicals and, and, and nutrients and bringing that into our stream as well. So um, you, you guys came to a stream restoration talk. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about streams before I get to the restoration part. Um, first of all, I wanna, I wanna say that rivers are more than just water. It's easy to look at uh, the, the channel running through your backyard and think, gosh, that's a great place to swim, and it is. But there's also uh, the organisms that live there, from the phytoplankton uh, and algae, all the way up to the, the trout, um, as well as vegetation, the submerged aquatic vegetation at, at the bottom, underwater, uh, and even more importantly, the vegetation on the banks. Um, and then the third thing uh, is, or, or another thing is that we tend not to think about is, is the sediment. Um, both the banks and the bottom of the channel dictate where that uh, water is actually flowing. And this interaction between the stream um, and, the, and the earth around it um, is super interesting and it's, and it's a profession that does not get enough love, fluvial geomorphology. A, uh, and it might be because nobody knows what that means. Well, fluvial meaning river and geo coming from earth and morphology, how they morph and shape each other um, is, uh, and so both how water and earth morph and shape each other um, creates this evolving channel system and um, the main takeaway is that rivers are ever changing. We can, we can think about, um, we, we tend to think that rivers are static, but if you think about it from a water droplets perspective, that water droplet is constantly moving and with it, it's bringing the sediment and the, and the stream beds from the channel little by little downstream with it. Um, this is a, the diagram on the right is, is a stream evolution model diagram. Um, all that it's saying is that you take your normal channel and then there's some, something that happens to it, a big storm event or some other, uh, some other event happens and all of a sudden that channel becomes um, smaller or it, it, it widens out or um, down cuts. And, all, and so trees in stage four, trees and banks fall in and, and now there's a, a, some graded material at the bottom where the channel recreates and or creates a new flood uh, floodway and a new channel path. Um, all that's to say, you don't need to memorize each stage of this, but all that to say that rivers are ever changing and that yes, some erosion is natural. 
But um, rivers also, uh, it, the stream evolution triangle, is, it's, it's important. Um, it's not just the interaction between water, the hydrology, or earth, the geology, but also the bi biology. Um, and it's uh, most importantly uh, to this are the, the vegetation on the stream banks that hold that bank together with its roots. And then the vegetation across the center of the channel that's put there by our engineering animal counterparts, um, beavers, they do a great deal in, in shaping how channels form. All right, so deep breath. Um, you guys made it through the theory portion. Uh, the rest are gonna be a lot more pictures uh, as Casey and Casey and Corey will also be showing a lot of photos. Uh, focus on individual stream reaches. Um, but don't, don't forget about what I talked about earlier, this higher flows in the river. Uh, it's all, um, this is creating some flooding, uh, more flooding than ever. And which is fine in situations like this, where there's a connected riparian buffer. Um, the, the water surface elevation increases, it spills over into the river left or the river right floodplain, um, just like these uh, pictures are showing. But what happens when there isn't a floodplain and, and as the water increases, it spills over into your garage or into these industrial buildings? Um, there's the water risk associated with flooding, but then there's also um, channel migration that it can occur. Um, and that is often seen by uh, bank erosion. This is something that we see in a lot of streams and you may see in your backyard. Some, remember, some is natural. Um, but we're seeing higher flows than ever. Uh, think, and, and here's an example of kind of the worst case scenario. This is, this is a video taken after Hurricane Ida or Tropical Storm Ida. This channel migrated about 15 feet uh, uh, to, towards the building. Uh, there was not a, there's no longer a floodplain associated. It, it moved all the sediment uh, downstream and uh, created quite a problem for this particular building. Um, and we're seeing this you know, more and more. So channel erosion, it's most dangerous to humans when it's near infrastructure like this. And the last thing I'll mention, because it cause, can cause some acute flooding, um, are culverts and bridges. Remember that rivers transport a lot more than water. It conveys sediment, uh, the woody debris, as you can see in the, in the bottom pictures, and as well as uh, aquatic organisms, fish and, and the like. Um, so culverts and bridges, they need to, they also, if done, if designed properly, would carry all four of those, the water, the sediment, the debris, um, as well as the, the fish. But here we see an undersized culvert uh, this will be a problem uh, during high flows and floods. Here we, uh, at the bottom, we see uh, debris not being able to fully get through uh, the system. And then I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, the picture on the upper right. This is a low head dam, but it feels like a, it's a big barrier to any fish. No fish can get upstream of it, which is a big deal with, uh, with other kinds of river restoration. Dam removal is a, a big topic onto itself that hopefully the Watershed Institute will have us back to talk about. Um, but what can you do about this? Before you get your shovel and, and backhoe ready, um, please remember permits. You need, uh, you, you mostly need permits on anything that requires earth moving beyond, um, you know, planting vegetation. Also remember to do your work on your property. Uh, some deeds extend to the center of the channel, other deeds extend right up until the bank. Um, so careful how that's written and please be safe when working around water. And the last thing to remember before you get going um, is that with teamwork you can have a much larger impact. Uh, here are two uh, fluvial geomorphologists helping each other across the channel. Uh, your team is going to be more like the municipal government um, or, or townships, your neighborhood, your local watershed group, like the Watershed Institute. Um, more can be accomplished in a group like this, um, including applying for grants and funding 
um, mechanisms, especially if there is water quality benefits to those restoration efforts. So uh, what can you do? What kind of projects can you do on your site? Um, well, the, the main thing, and I, and I hope this is the, uh, a, a big takeaway from this presentation is please protect your floodplain. Please maintain a, uh, a natural vegetated buffer like you see in the bottom right along the stream. And, and please, please, please do not mow up to your stream bank. Um, the importance of, of this vegetated buffer is that it helps to filter suspended sediment. It helps to filter uh, the nutrients for coming from the runoff. And also importantly, the roots from the uh, stream bank are not, are, are the, the roots from your lawn are nowhere near as strong as the roots from the trees in, the, in a forest buffer. And so those uh, banks that are held together by roots from grass are much more likely to become eroded like you see in the bottom left picture. What else can you do? You can reduce the flow into your stream. You can uh, promote infiltration and reduce runoff, uh, including uh, creating, uh, installing permeable surfaces, rain gardens, or infiltration drenches. Um, like you see in the, in the bottom left. This uh, right picture is a rain garden uh, that I took a photo of um, with a tour from the Watershed Institute and in their green infrastructure design course. Um, you can also promote vegetation with, by resodding patches in your lawn and, uh, and planting shrubs and trees to promote more infiltration. And please remember uh, water quality as well. Uh, minimize fertilization, limit the use of pesticides and herbicides, because all this ends up in the river, whether, whether it's through a storm drain like you see in the bottom or directly. Um, please remember good septic maintenance and, and limiting, limiting the use of uh, hazardous waste generally. What else can you do? Well, you can build up the bank. Um, and this may require be more than what you can do um, you know, with your own shovels. This, this is, uh, Casey is gonna talk a little bit more about this and a, a long project in Maryland uh, in a couple of minutes, but um, you know, core logs on the bottom left help uh, to stabilize banks uh, and promote vegetation growth. In the top left, we see um, a mix of, of, uh, of boulders and vegetation holding, rebuilding a, a under, undercut bank. And then you can go with the more extreme options of retaining walls and gabion structures uh, that you see in the right. So I hope that, um, I hope you take this away uh, from your time here, the, your Wednesday night, uh, listening to this presentation. That, um, that to please understand the context of your watershed, that some erosion and flooding is natural, but this is getting worse. Um, and there are things you can do to, uh, to counteract this. The most effective is probably, and the most natural is uh, this native vegetation to boost, uh, this to boost a riparian buffer. And then also um, do what you can but contact folks like the Watershed Institute for larger scale projects. Um, this includes rain gardens and large scale bank stabilization and native plantings. Um, and, and also a shout out to the Watershed Institute campus. If you haven't been there, um, I, I, it's really worth the trip. I went in September um, and got a tour of all their uh, rain, beautiful rain gardens acting uh, at just as I should in, a, in a, one of these intense afternoon thunderstorm downpours uh, where I met Olivia and got pretty wet. Um, so th thank you very much. Um, I will stick around for answering questions at the end, um, but Casey, I'm gonna hand it off to Casey now, uh, hopefully without much technical, technological issues. All right, thank you, Jake. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you confirm that you can see that? Sure can, thank, thanks, Casey. Awesome. 
So yeah, thank you, Jake, for giving us a background on the watershed as a whole, um, and then giving us a little overview of uh, what I'll be talking about in more depth, um, stream bank restoration techniques. Um, I am Casey Schrading. I am a water resources engineer as well with Princeton Hydro. I work with Jake and Corey. Um, I'm based out of the Princeton Hydro Maryland office, um, so a little further south. Um, today I'll be talking about some of the large scale techniques we use to stabilize banks on a stream restoration project in Maryland. And then I'll be talking about uh, some of the practices you can use in your own backyard to prevent stream bank erosion or help in reducing flooding. Um, and before I do that, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the causes of stream bank uh, degradation. Um, basically, to, to go along with what Jake was saying, uh, more impervious surfaces, climate change, it's resulting in more water in our streams and higher frequencies of that occurring. And when it does occur, there is uh, higher peaks and flow. Um, a lot of this is stuff you've already seen now, um, but the higher peaks and flow are causing more energy in our channels and thus resulting in more erosion. Um, the signs of a degraded stream are important to note. Uh, these can occur naturally, like Jake was uh, saying in his presentation, but uh, the things like climate change, and um, increased runoff are resulting in these happening much quicker and resulting in um, infrastructure uh, degrading. Here are a couple pictures of uh, streams on the project in Maryland that I worked on. Um, they have very incised banks. Uh, in the center picture, you'll notice that there really is no riparian buffer. Um, they have grass uh, mowed right up to the side of the stormwater uh, system. And in this picture on the right, you can see that uh, like a lot of uh, places with development, there are channels that people concrete, they put, uh, they put cement in, to try to straighten the channel and keep the channel where they want it to be. But the problem with that is it increases velocities and power in channels downstream and results in further impacts, failing infrastructure and when the stream doesn't have a place to go outside of its banks, it doesn't have floodplain connectivity, it just keeps going down and eroding your banks. It can widen, it can incise. Um, and uh, in these areas, the, these are the typical areas where we promote stream bank restoration and stream restoration as a whole. Um, another major sign of uh, a non-natural stream that we saw in Maryland uh, for example, was trucks and concrete. Um, this is obviously not a natural looking picture and the contractor had to take out this truck and the concrete in the background um, prior to our stream bank restoration. Why is it bad? Uh, stream bank erosion results in higher turbidity. It results in higher suspended sediments in the water. Um, when we have higher suspended sediment in the water, it results in impairment to aquatic life. Fish can't live normally. They can't um, uh, lay eggs or spawn. They can't um, breathe naturally. Uh, it results in impairments in uh, vegetation as well. And ultimately, if it is resulting in an impairment in the channel in your backyard, that leads to channels downstream and ultimately out into bays, for example, um, the project that I worked on uh, in Maryland, which I'll get into, uh, led to Chesapeake Bay, which has uh, very high impairments and, and is one of the reasons why we have so much work being done in the area for stream restoration. So we talked about some of the causes and impacts of degraded streams. What do we do about them? How do we prevent stream bank erosion? Um, Tinker's Creek Stream Restoration was a project that I uh, was lucky enough to oversee in Maryland. Um, it was the longest stream restoration in Maryland to date, or it is the longest stream restoration in Maryland to date with uh, about 41,000 linear feet of stream restoration. Uh, it's in Prince George's County, Maryland, near Print, uh, Joint Base Andrews. Um, as you can see, it's right outside of Washington, DC, along the I-95 corridor. It's a highly urbanized area. Uh, with a watershed that uh, has runoff from a lot of developments 
a lot of, uh, there's a golf course that leads into this uh, watershed. And uh, the existing conditions were very degraded. It had a lot of incised channels. It had um, failing infrastructure. Uh, one of the reasons for this restoration was for MS4 compliance. A lot of counties have to comply with the Clean Water Act and uh, keep their waters clean. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to restore degraded streams. So this is a screenshot from our design plans. Um, the gray shows the existing stream, which as you can see is very straight. It abuts properties with infrastructure. Um, what we aim to do with our design is promote sinuosity, promote increased stream length, and thus reducing the forces in the, in the uh, channel. Uh, we wanted to stabilize the banks. Um, so ultimately we wanted to reduce erosion and reduce flooding. First, uh, to restore a stream, to promote stream bank uh, restoration, we have to gather existing information. Um, you have to walk the stream, uh, figure out what is there, what are the current um, conditions of the channel. Um, we have to figure out what existing infrastructure are um, on site. We have to model the system, uh, show what the water is doing now, how much water we have in our system, and then we have to figure out what are the regulatory parameters on, uh, of our project? With, with most projects, I would say everything, all projects that I've worked on, you need a regulatory approval. Um, you can't go into a stream and just start digging. You have to get it approved. Um, so that is one thing that I would stress um, just because regulatory compliance is uh, very important. And uh, to do a project, you need the proper approvals. So now we'll get into some of the actual techniques you can use to restore a stream bank. Uh, rock toe stream bank stabilization is one uh, stabilization techniques, uh, technique that we use very often. Um, the idea is using rock to stabilize the toe of the bank and then using soil and uh, creating a floodplain to promote connectivity of the channel. Um, as you can see in the before picture, there's a very incised and eroded bank. And then afterwards, we have a rock toe created uh, with a floodplain bench. Um, a floodplain bench is something that we designed for to promote um, energy dissipation in, in a high flow event. Uh, we want that channel to be able to overtop the bank and have somewhere for that energy, that stream energy to dissipate. So creating a floodplain bench is, is giving the stream a place to release some of that energy. So more pictures of a constructed rock toe. Uh, we have a rock toe with uh, this floodplain bench. Um, we use soil from, from the area to create uh, what's called a soil lift. Uh, we have stabilization matting that we seed and later plant and eventually once the vegetation starts to come in, it becomes a very natural looking system. Um, similar, similarly, we have wood toe stabilization. Uh, wood toe stream bank stabilization is very similar to the rock toe uh, stabilization that I just talked about, um, but it has a more natural looking uh, appeal to, uh, to um, locals in the area, as well as the aquatic life in the streams. Uh, the, the wood used in this stream bank te uh, restoration technique um, promotes aquatic life. Uh, the other good thing about wood toe stream bank stabilization is that access is key to a lot of stream bank and stream restoration projects. Uh, unfortunately, you have to cut down some trees in some instances to get to your project site. And when you're able to use those trees that you've cut down in your stream bank uh, restoration, you can produce a project that has a lower impact and, and doesn't have any disposal, um, which reduces cost, and makes your project look more natural, um, and you're able to use uh, the trees that you've cut down in your stream. Um, here is just a, a couple pictures along the way 
uh, constructing a stream bank. Um, and then once you have ve vegetation start to come in, it starts to look more and more like a natural system that no one ever touched. We had uh, uh, Greenvest, our project partner, um, had a, a company come in and, and plant this entire system. And uh, now that the vegetation is growing, uh, a lot of these areas look like no one has ever touched it. It looks like a natural system. Um, and, and this wood tow is, is one of my favorites in stabilizing stream banks. Um, one of the things you have to take into account uh, with stream bank restoration is infrastructure stabilization. Let me get this out of the way. Um, infrastructure stabilization is critical to most stream restoration projects, especially as you're restoring stream banks. Um, you're bound to run into uh, infrastructure drainage pipes that you did not know were there. A lot of these pipes are not mapped. Um, we ran into um, issues like this where we had to adapt. We had to use adaptive management approaches um, to figure out what we're going to do with these pipes we did not know were there. Um, our proposed channel was approximately 15 feet from where the existing edge of channel was in this particular area. So we had to use piping to extend this uh, drainage pipe out into our proposed channel. Um, and I'm, I want to use this as an example to, to really let everyone know that uh, a lot of times, especially on large scale projects, there are things that come up that you are not planning for. And it's important to be able to adapt on the fly, um, to be able to work with your project partners, to work with uh, the regulatory, um, uh, regulatory parties involved to be able to get the proper approvals um, to implement a change. So again, another example of infrastructure stabilization on our stream bank restoration project. Uh, we had a manhole for a stormwater system that abutted our stream channel. Um, so as we restore our stream channel, we have to protect our uh, infrastructure. We were able to do so um, with a combination of rock and soil and eventually plantings. Um, another example is a manhole outfall. This outfall was obviously falling apart and it was causing major erosion on the river right bank, which abutted uh, private landowners property. Um, so we were able to come in and restore the area. We added uh, riprap stabilization along the property slope um, we added what's called pool dissipation. We added a, a scour hole here where we were able to slow down water um, in high storm events um, to promote a stable and more natural looking environment. Uh, and then there's small scale techniques that we were able to use on a large scale project, which uh, probably relate more um, to a project that would occur in someone's backyard uh, with smaller scale. Um, erosion. You can use core logs, uh, which are logs, uh, as you see in this right photo, of natural organic fibers. Um, you can handle them with your own two hands, stake them in, uh, and, and they do a good job with, with small-scale stream bank restoration. Another example here uh, along a stream that we restored with uh, a slight area of erosion, we were able to bring in a core log um, stake it in and, and promote stabilization. So I just talked about some of the larger scale stream bank uh, stabilization techniques that we use. Um, what can you know a private landowner do uh, if they notice stream bank erosion in their own backyard? Um, like Jake mentioned and like Corey is going to go into uh, soon here, uh, a riparian buffer is uh, a very big thing. It's, it's very important to keep um, an area next to the streams uh, growing. We don't want um, mowed grass right up to the side of your stream. We want to be able to promote natural growth next to your stream channel, native plantings, um, stormwater best management practices like rain gardens in your backyard. Uh, we want to be able to slow the flow of water into your stream. If it can infiltrate if it can um, go into the ground and slow down before going into your channel, we can start 
slowing that uh, curve of water, of, of stream flow into our channels. Um, there's some smaller scale efforts that you can do, but a lot of times with stream bank restoration, they are larger scale projects that need county and, uh, and nonprofit help to complete. Um, a lot of these projects, like I said, need regulatory approvals, they need funding. Um, so one of the things that we recommend is if you see stream bank erosion in your backyard, contact your local governments, the town, the county. There's requirements that a lot of towns and counties have uh, to promote stream bank restoration or promote clean waters. And if you have um, photos showing erosion in your backyard uh, over time, uh, it can help paint a picture to the county that there is something going on and, and they can help uh, get funding to be able to do something about it. Um, watershed associations, nonprofits, the Watershed Institute, um, reaching out to you know, these nonprofits uh, to, to see what you can do and, and how they can help. Um, there's grants available uh, to, to go towards stream bank uh, erosion projects to stream restoration projects. And then of course, there's private firms like Princeton Hydro um, that do work in this industry. Um, we can provide uh, grant funding assistance. Um, and oftentimes we are the ones working with nonprofits, the towns and the counties uh, to complete these projects. Um, so as a summary, uh, stream bank stabilization is important in reducing erosion. Uh, which ultimately reduces um, impacts on, on the waters and aquatic organisms. Uh, stream bank restoration can promote uh, uh, flood control. It can protect infrastructure and promote aquatic life. It presents opportunities to plant native species and, and promote invasive species control. Um, you know, I can't stress enough the importance of riparian buffers, which Corey's going to go into next. Um, and then reach out, you know, there are all kinds of organizations that are involved in this industry that are, are pushing to get grants uh, for projects like these. Um, reach out to your local governments to see what they can do, um, because a lot of these projects, you know, it can, it can get expensive to do stream bank restoration, but talking to the right people and getting the right people involved can ultimately lead to a very successful uh, project. So oh, I am not going to take questions right now. We're going to save that for the end. Um, but that's all I have. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, that segment of the presentation. Um, and I am going to pass it off to Corey next. All right. Um, now everybody see screen. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Jake and Casey. Uh, great job. Um, and then thanks to um, Jim and Olivia and the Watershed Institute for um, reaching out and having you know Princeton Hydro come and give this talk. Um, all right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Spiroff, and I'm the um, landscape architect at Princeton Hydro, um, and I work within the uh, natural resources group of the firm. Um, and tonight I'm going to present on a project uh, of ours located in Bucks County, Pennsylvania on Carversville Farm. So I'm just going to present a, a brief history and background of the project, um, talk to you about how the site was selected, touch a little bit on the funding. Um, I'm going to skip over the, uh, the engineering portion. I think Jake and Casey covered that pretty well. Um, and then I'm going to spend uh, probably the most amount of time covering um, floodplains, you know, types of plants um, and our implementation process. So uh, the Carrisville farm is located um, in the Delaware River watershed um, and was historically used for silviculture. Um, under new direction, however, in 2014, the Carversville Farm Foundation, um, which I'll refer to as CFF from now on, um, was established as a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Um, and uh, Carversville uh, CFF has a 
mission statement. Um, they want to produce fresh, sustainable food to populations who lack access to a balanced diet. Um, number two is to utilize advanced sustainable farming techniques to provide these services while regenerating the agro ecosystem. And the third one is to provide education and outreach to other local farms um, and serve as an example um, for sustainable organic agro ecosystem services. Um, so to integrate their ecological restoration into the farming, CFF has four guiding farming objectives um, for their animals, uh, their livestock spend their days outside in the pasture, often mixed together. Um, and this ensures that they always have access to green grass and fresh air and sunshine and all the things that we like. Um, they're rotated frequently through the pastures, which helps to evenly distribute the manure on the land while also fertilizing the soil and the plants. Um, and because they're rotating um, and constantly moving around from field to field, there's a reduced, reduced risk of um, contamination to the local waterways. For their plants, they want to integrate native plants into the riparian corridor and meadow systems. Um, their goal for water is to reduce storm flow and improve infiltration. And then their final objective or farm goal is for the soils, and that's to grow deep living soil to promote the growth of native plants and improve the water cycle and the organic matter in the soil. Um, and then just uh, a few of the groups that CFF partners with um, is uh, Broad Street Ministry, uh, the Coalition Against Hunger, um, Face to Face, and then the Bucks County Audubon Society. Um, so getting into the project a little more, um, Princeton Hydro got involved with CFF um, when we were privately contracted to complete a watershed and stream assessment of the Pentecostal Creek. Uh, this involved doing water quality monitoring, uh, hydraulic and nutrient loading assessments, and also geomorphic assessments. Um, and then with this data, we identified critical reach impairments that could be corrected to improve uh, stream function, groundwater infiltration, and repairing conditions, pretty much everything that we could do to meet, help CFF meet their mission. Um, and many of these problem areas we identified are, are common in stream systems surrounded by agricultural and suburban settings. And some of these common issues we see, and perhaps you've seen uh, these in your own backyard or local waterway, um, and, and Jake and Casey did a really good job of talking about these. Um, you know, there were the reduced riparian buffers or, or lack of vegetation, um, the waterway being disconnected from the floodplain, um, and the historic and sediment transport. Um, and then as you can see from these two images, um, this is on the Carversville farm site. Um, these resulting impacts uh, eventually uh, degrade um, stream life. So shifting from the diagnosis to the implementation, um, there are a few key concepts that we use in our approach. Um, the first one is seeing what grant options were available to us. Um, some of the common ones for the Pennsylvania uh, region is the PA Growing Greener Grants. Um, there's the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources or DCNR. And then there is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation or NIFWIF um, and their Delaware Watershed Conservation Funds. And then when you're approaching um, you know, grants, um, some of the things you wanna keep in mind is, um, ideally you want your project objective to match those of the grant, uh, specifically for Growing Greener, Growing Greener, which is Growing Greener, Growing Greener, which we used for, um, for this project, um, the watershed objective of reducing non-point source pollution was a focal point. Um, and then also the integration of the multifunctional riparian corridor in agricultural settings was the second um, objective that we were aiming for. Um, it's really important to develop um, support by building local relationships. Um, 
for this project, it was the Bucks County Conservation District. Um, and then uh, it's also um, beneficial for you to develop a match. Um, money provided by CFF versus grant contributions. Um, and often there are requirements for matches in, in, um, in these grant processes. Um, so like I said, there was an engineering portion to this project, but I'm gonna skip over that and focus on the planting. Um, so as I said uh, earlier, the, the goal of this project was a, a multifunctional riparian buffer. Um, which is a little bit slightly unique from the um, applications that um, Casey and Jake were presenting on. So um, PA's um, DCNR definition of a multifunctional riparian forest buffer is, is one that provides opportunities for, for harvesting products such as nuts, berries, woody florals and forbs and um, potentially woody biomass. Um, however, it does not permit inputs such as fertilizer or manure. Um, additionally, harvesting is not permitted within the first, team, first 15 feet of the buffer. And overall DCNR's recommendation for these multifunctional um, repairing buffers um, is a minimum width of 35 feet. Um, based on site assessments and coordination with the CFF, we established that the ideal width for the multifunctional buffer should be 100 feet um, and made up of three zones, which would allow for harvestable and grazable fruits and nuts. Um, and the purpose of the multifunctional riparian buffers, aside from the environmental benefits, is to create opportunity to uh, produce perennial crops of native nuts and fruits. Um, as I mentioned, floral trees and shrubs that can be harvested and, and sold by the farm for local use. Um, and when, uh, um, when designing the multifunctional riparian buffer for CFF, it was really important for us to first determine what, what their needs were. Um, did they want to produce fruits and nuts for commercial production or livestock feed, personal use? Was it, was it for wildlife? All of these um, factors were really important um, to select which species of trees and shrubs would work best for, for the farm's needs. Um, and then after asking these questions, we knew that the primary agricultural purpose of the riparian buffer would be used for active turkey livestock grazing um, with the added future potential of harvesting native fruits and nuts. Um, and so knowing this, we worked with Carversville Farm Foundation to develop a plant palette focused around these intended uh, purposes. Um, we had to approach this task with the knowledge that we would need some production in the first growing season, um, but it was also really important uh, to convey to the client that, you know, some of these species that we're proposing wouldn't develop a usable harvest for anywhere from like 20 to 30 years. Um, and so once we had our goals and objectives in place, um, we started on our planting plan, which followed a zoned approach recommended by DCNR. DCNR. Um, <clears throat> And I will uh, talk about each of those zones now. So zone one um, is a 40 foot wide undisturbed uh, area nearest to the stream bank and planted with native trees and shrubs. Uh, and the primary objectives of this zone were focused on water quality and uh, wildlife habitat improvement. Um, this zone, once it is mature, will slow stormwater runoff, reduce stream temperature, stabilize the stream bank and provide shelter for, for local wildlife. Um, in this zone, we planted, uh, I think a total of 210 trees and shrubs um, with an average facing of eight feet on center. Um, and then an additional 100 black willow live stakes along the banks. Um, and some of these tree species included um, but weren't limited to uh, silver maple, flowering dogwood, uh, tulip poplar, swamp white oak, 
pin oak, um, and then some of the shrubs that we included were uh, shadbush or red osier dogwood, winterberry holly, spice bush, and um, some southern arrowwood. Zone two was another 40 foot wide um, section, um, but it's more actively managed. Um, and the primary objective of this zone, uh, we were focused on absorbing excess nutrients from the agricultural land and uh, attempting to degrade any kind of pesticide um, while also slowing stormwater down. Uh, CFF wanted to, to focus primarily on native fruit production in this zone with the future possibility of harvesting for uh, human consumption. Uh, but also provide for turkey foraging. So the important thing for us to remember in this area, because it is an active farm, that uh, we could use some cultivars. Um, and really it's, it's about what meets the needs of the farm or what meets the needs of your project um, in your own backyard. Um, so we, we heavily advise on using native plants. Um, but in this instance, it was a little bit of both. Um, again, we planted about uh, 210 uh, individual plants um, with an average spacing of eight to 10 feet. Um, but like I said, because this was for native fruit production, our tree species were a little bit more unique, like um, downy service berry, um, pawpaw, some shagbar kickery, um, persimmon, American plum, and then we would have things in there like scarlet oak. Um, and then for shrub species, we would use like um, black chokeberry, American hazelnut, American gooseberry, uh, some common elderberry. Um, and then we knew it would be a little bit of a risk, but we also installed some uh, high bush blueberry. So rounding out the last uh, 20 feet of the 100 foot buffer, is, is zone three. Uh, and this is the most active portion of the buffer. Uh, at CFF, this zone will function or does function as the first treatment feature in the riparian buffer. Um, though it is actively managed and planted for immediate and high crop yields, uh, this zone is the first to intercept um, nutrient and sediment runoff from any active upslope. Um, and that's primarily through dispersion of uh, surface water and through the promotion of infiltration. Um, zone three is also the most flexible uh, because it allows for various crops and maintenance uh, and harvesting methods. Um, we really uh, relied on CFF uh, to inform us of the best species to meet their needs. Um, and what they ended up selecting was um, two cultivars of blackberry and two cultivars of raspberry. Um, and we ended up planting around 400 of those. Um, so moving on to the uh, site preparation and implementation. Um, so to implement everything that I, I just covered in the last three slides, which I know was a lot, um, site, site preparation was really essential. Um, the first task was clearing zone one. Um, and that was, again, the first uh, 40 feet closest to the stream bank. Um, it was heavily vegetated with your typical stream hedgerow, uh, mostly invasives and poison ivy. Um, but lucky for us, we were able to get a head start on, on this and got some much appreciated assistant from, assistance from CFS resident goats, uh, Jeffrey and Melvin. Um, they had um, some temporary housing um, and it was a shifting pen that we could move up and down the, um, uh, the buffer. Um, and so as, you know, Jeffrey and Melvin got through most of the leafy stuff, um, we could come in behind them with heavier equipment. Um, and what could be brush hog, we brush hog, and what could be pulled with either a weed wrench or by hand, we, we pulled all of that out. Um, 
And so now that we had access to, to the area, we could get to work planting. So after you know the holes were dug and the plant, the we've uh, placed the plants and everything was backfilled. Um, we also incorporated a native seed mix into the plant for stabilization and pollinator value. Um, the, sleep, the seed was uh, lightly raked in and straw mulch was placed on the top as an additional stabilization measure. Um, just an overview of our planting schedule. Zone one was planted in the fall of 2019 and zones two and three were planted in the spring of uh, 2020. And uh, while we were planting in the spring, we actually moved Jeffrey and Melvin to the other side of the stream um, so they could get a head start on getting the invasives and non-desirable species down in that area uh, for any uh, future planting projects that we're able to implement. And so here's a, a more recent um, photo of that zone three with the raspberries and blackberries in the, um, in the center there. Um, as you can see, they're planted in manageable rows and buffers of vegetation are on either side. Um, and you know, we feel this is a, a great visual for the possibilities of multifunctional repairing buffers. So what's the next move? Um, so implementation, um, continue to secure funding and for the implementation and restoration of the remainder of the headwater reach. Um, and we've applied for additional PA growing greener grant funds um, for that. And then um, lastly, you know, educating the local farmers and um, local neighbors. Um, as you can see from this presentation, not everything um, is strictly applied to, uh, you know, the farming realm. Um, uh, CFF offers workshops on sustainable farming practices um, and facilitates information exchanges within the region. Um, and once the project is complete, um, CFF would like to host fellow farmers and showcase uh, the benefits of restoring nat natural floodplains, uh, stabilizing head cuts and um, actively eroding agricultural land um, while simultaneously restoring forested riparian buffers within an agricultural setting. Um, and we can do this by demonstrating how stream restoration projects can enhance uh, farming operations while simultaneously restoring aquatic resources um, and that proposed projects <clears throat> can have a positive cumulative impact on the watershed's ability and in particular this watershed's ability to meet um, TMDL total maximum daily lo load objectives um, and support Pentecostal Creek's um, designation as a high quality cold water fishery for migratory fish. And that is all we have. Thank you, uh, Jake, Casey, and Corey for those great presentations. Um, now we'll open it up to some questions from the audience, which I saw were already being answered in the chat. Um, but one that I saw um, wasn't addressed was uh, Wendy asked that some areas adjacent to streams are wetlands and can one go in and plant vegetation in a wetland without a DEP permit? So that's open for anyone. Corey, do you want to do, do you uh, want to take that or? You can nod your head now. <laughs> um, I. I, I think it depends um, on, on this kind of the scale of the project. Um, the wetlands uh, are a very specific thing that, um, that you know, we delineate on projects. We hire somebody else out to actually delineate the wetlands. Um, so, you know, it, what appears next to the stream uh, doesn't necessarily fit that New Jersey DP or the, or the Army Corps uh, description. Um, and, uh, so, so that's one thing is, is not, not everything next to the stream is necessarily wetlands. 
Um, and and I, I would certainly recommend uh, look, you know, any, any large scale implement, implementation definitely should get a permit, but uh, in terms of, you know, in your backyard, um, it, it may be something you can do without. Okay, great. Um, let's see, another question is, can you use riprap to help compromise stream edges and do you need to contact DEP before you do so? I'm assuming they mean like along their property. Um, yeah, uh, so riprap definitely can be used. Uh, we, as a, we, we try not to um, use it. It's, it's kind of a, a last resort. Um, in the, but in the cases of where it's protecting infrastructure and you know other things, it certainly is is a is a technique that definitely can be used. It just doesn't promote the the ecosystem, the vegetation growth through the riprap or um, the aquatic habitat uh, under under the channel um, in in a way to uh, provide the maximum eco ecosystem. Uh, uh, support, but it's definitely a valid technique and can be used in terms of the permitting. I, w I would imagine that again, any, any, um, I, I don't know what the threshold is for requiring a permit, but I would assume if you're bringing, you know, truckloads, uh, in that it would definitely require one. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And, um, is it possible to save a stream bank under a tree where half the roots are already exposed by the stream bank erosion. Um, they're asking if trading off the price of cutting down the tree um, versus the further erosion. Um, so I guess they're asking about remediating around the stream, the, the exposed tree roots if it's not too far gone. What do you think you would do with that? Oftentimes, if, if you have an eroded uh, uh, tree trunk or eroded, if the roots are already coming out, likely the tree is either already dead or very close to being dead, and eventually it will fall. Um, I would recommend taking it out in that instance. We had a couple scenarios on that Tinker's Creek restoration project where we had trees along the edge of our channel that we wanted to keep. And we actually implemented a riprap technique around those trees and a couple of them ended up falling anyway. So we had to go back and implement a stream bank restoration technique in those areas. Um, so I would say a lot of times if the tree is already exposed and falling, it will end up being worse if you leave it. And just to add one thing to that, um, in terms of the, the quality of the river, it, it, you can certainly leave the, it, you know, if there's room for that tree to fall naturally and, and not harm anything, um, that as you saw in Casey's uh, presentation, we love woody debris being in the river. It creates a, 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 some great uh, scour uh, for fish and, and creates a lot of, uh, there's a lot of value in, in leaving that tree or even just the tree roots in the river if possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, another question is uh, referring to the Maryland project, uh, how many miles of stream were remediated and at what cost? Do you know approximately the cost, say, for 100 yards of the whole um, project? Um, there was 41,000 linear feet restored. I don't know what the cost was per 100 yards. We were not involved in the actual cost aspect of that project, we were contracted to do the design and oversight for the project. So we don't know how much the actual construction was. I think we have estimates, but no, no final costs. Uh, how do you repair stream bank erosion in a dense forest with slopes and no room for heavy equipment? It's a tough question. <laughs> Depending yes, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk? Yeah, go, sorry. Can, can you repeat that question? It was... Sorry about that, um, let's see. How do you repair stream bank erosion in a dense forest with slopes that have little or no room for heavy equipment? Um, I guess oftentimes in dense forests, uh, I would, 
I would want to see that situation because in, in dense forest, I don't know how much uh, erosion would be occurring non-naturally. And if there was no infrastructure being destabilized, then the cost of trying to come up with a solution would probably outweigh the, the ultimate benefit you would get by going in there and restoring that section of channel. I'm sure there are ways you can go about it. Uh, you could probably cut your own access in and create very long rock ramps that wind back and forth to get down into the channel along street, uh, steep slopes. But the cost of doing so would be so great that it would probably would never be implemented, especially in an area of a deep forest where there's no infrastructure um, being, being or at risk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and if I just want to get back to Wendy real, real quick, um, it, it, oftentimes it's it's situational um, depending on where you're located um, and things like that. Um, so if you have like a, a specific answer, um, you know, Casey, Jake, and myself aren't uh, the regulatory specialists within the firm, um, but I'm on the natural resources team with those regulatory specialists. Um, so you can always email us, um, and this goes for anyone on the call. If you have a regulatory question, um, you can email me and I can get it into the right hands um, and we can answer that. Um, and then uh, just as an aside, the, the approximate cost of Tinker's, the construction cost was 15 million. Thank you. Um, and Corey was referring to the question about if wetlands are on your property or near a stream, if you can plant directly into them without a permit. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, send some photos and, and we'll, uh, and, and we can pass those along to the specialists. Um, I think we have time for two more quick questions. Um, so one I think will be pretty quick. Are, are bamboo trees good or bad along stream banks? Um, so, so bamboo is sort of a, a mixed bag. Um, it's funny, I've, I've, I've had the same question run through my head multiple times because, it, you know, it's super dense. It does a really great job of, of holding um, the soil together. Um, and um, I believe that the, I believe it's an acre of bamboo absorbs 30% more carbon than its native forest habitat. Um, but at the same time, you lose everything else that's associated with having native species. You lose, um, you, you lose the bugs, then you lose the birds, then you lose the predatory species. Um, so while it may be good if it's existing for, for holding the stream bank in place, it's probably not beneficial in the long run if it expands too much further to the point where it becomes, you know, a, a problem. Yeah, bamboo also spreads really easily and is very aggressive, so it's hard to control the spread of it. So don't plant bamboo. Yeah, that, that's the answer I was hoping you'd say. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. And then I think the last question, um, which is interesting, is how many months or years do you tend to monitor a restoration project? and how often do you have to do more construction after a project is done? Um, so uh, in case you, I can see, so you uh, unmuted yourself and you can jump in uh, if you feel like it. Um, typically it's um, project specific. Um, we've worked on mitigation banks where uh, the monitoring period is five plus years. Um, so, um, the answer for that is that it varies, but more often than not, there is a, a period of monitoring um, uh, that coincides with each project. Um, and then uh, it's not super often that we have to go back and correct um, our work um, because we do have people on site um, doing construction oversight. So like Casey was on site most of the time for the installation of Tinker's Creek. So he uh, watched with a close eye um, all the contractors installing those features. Um, I will say with plants, a lot of times when 
those things are installed, there's often uh, survival rate expectations. Um, so, you know, it might be like an 80% coverage uh, that you have to reach. Um, and then often with, um, with tree species or woody species, um, for our projects, we often have a one year um, from the date that they're installed um, contract, meaning if they die within the first year, then the contractor's responsible for replacing that wood material. I wanna throw out a plug for pre-construction monitoring as well. Oftentimes projects don't get the funding or the time to do pre-construction monitoring, but that is something that's, uh, that I hope becomes more and more common. Uh, if there's a project that anyone is um, aware of or involved with that has the ability to do pre-construction pre -construct, construction monitoring, I would, uh, I would definitely push for that. Thank you. Any uh, lingering thoughts on that question or anything else? Uh... I would just say, uh, now that we're about done here, if anyone does have any further questions that they want to ask any of us, please reach out. Our emails are in the slides that you'll all get afterwards. So, you know, we're happy to answer and, uh, and thank you everyone for coming out. Yeah, thank you um, all for your awesome presentations. They're so informative and we could tell it was interesting by all the questions we weren't able to get to tonight. Um, so Corey, if you'd be able to pull up the slides um, before everyone goes, I just wanted to let you know about the next Watershed Wednesdays. Pri has also put the information about the next uh, webinar, which is happening in on February 16th about urban gardens. Um, there's the link to registration there. Thank you. Um, yeah, this will be co-hosted with IELTS um, Incorporated of Trenton, where they'll be talking about sustainable practices that homeowners can use to make the most of an urban garden and sharing their experiences growing in small spaces. They'll also show how small scale efforts using sustainable practices can help improve water and land quality, community health, and also increase habitat for important pollinators. So on the next slide, um, you can see you can register for the Watershed Wednesdays or check out any of the other Watershed Institute free programming on our website here, the watershed org um, and this webinar was recorded and will be available to all that registered and probably on the watershed's youtube channel as well thank you all so much for coming tonight and hope to see you next time <laughs>